we are good and we are bad and we are ugly. All of it is true of all of us. We are multidimensional people. And so all of this can be true, but that doesn't mean that just because we have bad and ugly in us, we don't get to belong. I'm Michael Tamlin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is Ritu Basin, social justice advocate, entrepreneur, and author of We've Got This, Unlocking the Beauty of Belonging, a book about building a culture where everyone feels welcome to show up with their whole self. And it's also a very personal book in which she shares her own difficult journey towards a sense of belonging. Ritu Basin, welcome to Kobo. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. With my intro just now, I had to make a choice between focusing on your new book, We've Got This, or attempting to introduce the listener to all of the many facets of your work and yourself, uh, because you have a lot going on all the time. I, so right now, how do you introduce yourself? Oh, that's such a good question. I, Because I'm so excited about my new book, We've Got This, I, it, it's what I'm focusing on. Like it's, it's front and center in my mind. I'm so excited for it to help to change people's lives because both writing it and all of the messages I share in it, digging deep into them have really helped to transform mine. At the very beginning of this, uh, of the book, we've got this, you refer to a concept that you call in shorthand PPA, positive, perfect, and achieving. And I think we all want to be all of those things, but a lot of what goes on in this book is you trying to set that aside because it's a kind of a trap. Yes. So I, from a very young age, because of all of the experiences I was having, including enduring years of relentless racist bullying and growing up in an immigrant household. My parents came to Canada from India now over 50 years ago. As new immigrants, they were really grappling with how to raise us, like how white Canadian should they make us, how Indian Punjabi should they make us. I grew up, I grew up with a lot of cultural confusion and from a young age, because of the bullying, because of the cultural confusion, I learned that if I put on my positivity, perfection, achievement armor, my PPA armor, it would help me to be loved, to like, to be liked, to shield myself from biases, inequities, judgment of others. And the thing is that when we anchor to constantly being positive and charming and radiating sunshine, and then we work really hard to be perfect, like everything is in order and everything is in line, and we're really fixated on achievement, moving up the corporate ladder, winning accolades, being in the news media, like whatever it is, our thing, our jam. When we do these three things, of course, it helps us. It helps us to shield from biases. It helps us to hide our woundedness and our hurt and pain. But at the end of the day, it ultimately harms us. And that's certainly what happened with me. I got so used to wearing a PPA armor that I got lost in wearing the armor. And I it helped me to hide some of my pain and woundedness, but it prevented me from doing the heavy work. And it wasn't until I started to shed the armor, like really do my darndest to take it off and do my healing work and move from constantly radiating sunshine, even when I didn't feel like it, to speaking my truth around how I'm truly actually actually feeling, which sometimes is really quite cranky, to be honest. Like I feel cranky a lot because um, I'm a human being. And then also to accepting and embracing my imperfections. And actually there is no such thing as perfection. And just being like, it does not need to be perfect. There is no such thing as perfect. And then surrendering into 
not having to constantly be seeking out external forms of affirmation and validation and really just tapping into my personal power within that I have started to feel more joy in my life and more anchoring in my life. And that's why it's so important for us as we navigate through our lives, as we navigate through workplaces, we make our way through society. It's so important that we anchor to our own belonging. You talk about those patterns beginning in childhood. This book opens with yourself in adulthood on a retreat in India where things don't seem to be going well. Can you set that first scene for us? I was in my early 30s navigating, working through the in the corporate towers. I was a I decided at a young age to help do social justice work based on the experiences I had had my I had watched my parents having that I would I wanted to become a lawyer I went to law school and I, instead of going and working in a social justice clinic or doing something to that effect I saw the cool kids go and work in the towers so I said I'm going to go work in the towers because that's where all the cool kids go so there I was in my early 30s in the t in the towers with my PPA armor on, having to constantly contend with subtle, nuanced messaging around, don't be different, be like us, be like the dominant culture that makes up the leadership ranks. And as a young woman, as a young woman of color, born of immigrant parents navigating this type of culture, I constantly felt pressure to mask aspects of my identity, to push down who I am, to shield myself from the fear of bias. And because of this, I got so used to morphing aspects of my identity and doing this dance. I call it the performing dance. When I say performing, I don't mean like high performance. I mean like life is a stage and we're actors putting out a curated performance of who we are. It's kind of like social media today that by the time I hit my early 30s, with equipped with my armor and the performing mask and being on a stage, I had become really successful because as I already mentioned to you, Michael, it works when we twist and conform mm. and we put the armor on. It works. But if you had asked me, how do you feel about your life and who you are? I would have said to you, I feel spiritually vacant. I feel soulless. I actually don't know who I am anymore. And a few things happened, which ultimately led me to decide to take a sabbatical from my law firm job in the towers and i took three months off and two of the months i went to the south of india and i studied yoga i did my first yoga teachers teacher training uh, certificate and when i first arrived at the yoga ashram and i share a story about my of this experience as the opening section of my book, when I got to the yoga ashram, there were a few hundred of us there from around the world to study yoga. The ashram handed us a uniform to put on. And I put the uniform on, I start attending the meditation sessions, classes, etc. And within a few days of being there, I'm meditating and I literally hear in my head, my inner voice says to me, who are you going to be while you're here? And it was fascinating because that thought, who am I going to be? What side am I going to show? Kept creeping up because there I am on the other side of the planet with a few hundred random strangers. No one knows who I am. They don't know my name, my title, where I grew up. I don't have any markers of privilege on. I'm wearing a uniform just like them. And I'm stripped of all of my Rithu created personas I was using to navigate my life up until that point. And the question, who are you going to be, leaps into my head. And the reason it came to me is because there were so many curated personas. And I realized in that moment that, wow, I actually don't know who I am anymore. And those two months of meditating, engaging in self-reflection, being disconnected from the curated life I had created back home that I actually hated, 
just gave me the foundation I needed to reset my life and to connect in with who I really am and who I wanted to be going forward. And ultimately what it led to is it unlocked for me my authenticity and it set the stage for me to consistently claim belonging in everything I did after that. I described this book in the intro as a book about building a culture of belonging. But if readers are expecting a, a you know a diversity and inclusion game plan, you know, kind of a you know a how to manual, that's not what this book is setting out to do exactly. You're sharing a lot of your own personal narrative here and taking a lot of care to describe those feelings of not belonging and where they've come from, you know, especially in your life and in your life growing up. Was that what you thought you were going to do when you set out to write this book? Did you have a sense of what the shape of it was going to be? It's a great question. So uh, I'm going to take it back to my first book, The Authenticity Principle. Mm -hmm. When I wrote The Authenticity Principle now several years ago, I said to myself, Rithu, write a really in-depth, personal empowerment book that really helps people to be who they are. It's going to be more of a self-help book. It's not going to be particularly leadership focused, although I know leaders are going to use it. So yes, yes, let's have it be somewhat leadership focused. And what's so fascinating is years later, when I read The Authenticity Principle, I'm like, this is very leadership focused. It's a leadership book. <laughs> it <laughs> it's, is or at least it's a book, book all leaders should read. Yes. So it is a leadership book. I, I don't know why I thought that it wasn't, it was more of a empowerment, well-being, self-help book, but no, it is. <laughs> now it's about self-leadership. How do you direct yourself? But really it's also a map, an action plan, a guide map for, for leaders. So when I sat down to write, we've got this, and I'm happy to share my tale about that because it was not a straight linear warm, fuzzy path. It was filled with all kinds of hardship and tears and screaming and just all of it spiritually. And like, just, I just can't even, but when I sat down to write my second book, which turned into, we've got this, I said to myself, no, this time I'm going to pour my heart and soul into it from a well-being, empowerment, self-help perspective. But I know that leaders are going to be reading it. I know that people are going to be reading it from a professional growth perspective. So what I decided to do is based on the benefit of having one book that was very leadership focused, having years of teaching about the book in workplace environments and uh, at large in society, I decided to marry storytelling with prescriptive content. In other words, I decided to share, here's what the research says, here's what the data says, here's what the frameworks are. Although I don't actually say that in the book a lot. I just, I name it. Mm -hmm. But what I did is I chose stories to model the frameworks and the data and the research. And, and the reason I did this is because even for myself along the last several years, I've noticed that I want to hear the frameworks. I want to hear the research. I want to know the foundations. But what I really want are the stories. It's the tell me what this looks like. Tell me about a situation where this happened to you. How did you put this into effect? How did you make this happen? Or how did you apply this? Or for that matter, I want to hear about people's lived experiences because when I hear about their stories, here's what happens in my heart. It's the, oh my goodness, you went through that? And I instantly feel empathy for pain because I've had a lot of pain in my life. And then I feel like, wow, you would understand what I'm going through. We could be connected because you would understand what my life is like at times, which is so hard. And it makes me feel like I have the courage and the ability to be vulnerable as well. 
And then I also love hearing about what did you do to get through this so that I can be inspired? So that's what I wanted with We've Got This, which is why when you read the book or you listen to the book, you'll see that what I have done is every chapter as starts with a story or and ends with a story and even has story embedded throughout it. And so I've used a lot of storytelling as a way to deliver the message. And the final thing I'll say about this, because this was all deliberate, as you can see, is that I feel like in this moment of time, the world is really aching. Like we've had years of a pandemic. Our The way in which we work has been just like we've done a 360 180, 360, it's a consistent whirlwind of change. We know from loneliness studies that are constantly coming out that people feel more lonely and disconnected from others and communities than ever before. I just, I felt that our souls need love and affirmation and validation and connection. And that doesn't come through research and data and frameworks, reading that. It comes through stories and narratives. Like, do you see me? Do you feel me? Do you understand? And so I really, I was writing for this moment in time as well. And that that focus on story does such a good job of, you know, I've, it both taps into the, the, that place that we have as a reader that that pulls us into things that are emotional that yeah that kind of sets aside the purely information finding critical faculty and and puts yourself in the place of you know of the narrator the but it's also kind of a sneaky workbook at the same time um and so i was you know i was in the book i'm in the first chapter i'm right into um into your story and then there are there are questions at the uh, at the end there are moments of reflections at the end of each chapter um that relate to the themes of the chapter before and then for all chapters you ask what are the key insights you have picked up what are the stories or messages that most resonated with you and what are one or two things that you do differently and that you know, those seem kind of innocuous, but they actually you know, sent me for a bit of a spin because as the reader, I then had to reflect on your experiences and put myself directly into the narrative and compare my experiences to those and pull my own insights out of those and do that on all of the themes of the personal stories that preceded me. Um, so they're provocative and they ask for reflection and in a way, you don't get to just put yourself on narrative autopilot and just kind of float along. The, each chapter you know, makes you look at your own experiences, look at yourself in the mirror, look at yourself in um, kind of in contrast to what you've just read. And I, you know, I found that initially a little jarring and then really interesting. And so I'm... I'm wondering when in the writing process did that idea of, I want to share experiences through stories, but I also want people to ask questions, you know, when that showed up and what you were trying to do there. So I love this question so much, Michael, because, it, and you know, I should also say it's so fascinating to speak to someone who is an expert in books around book creation, because I've been talking a lot about the book's messaging but what I love about our discussion is that I'm we're talking about the mechanics of as an author, how do you actually write and create a book and plan out strategy for for getting your message out there? And what I what what it, I'm smiling from ear to ear because a conversation conversation like this, it reminds me that I'm an author. Because I, as a, I'm actually a professional speaker, like if we go back to the beginning of this conversation, Michael, when you said, "How would you describe yourself?" Like I would say, mm -hmm. "Oh, I'm a prof I'm a professional speaker, and I'm an advocate for authenticity, belonging, and I'm an empowerment coach, and all that." But I'm also an author, and that label, that term, 
it's taken me a minute to embrace it, but I am an author. I've written two effing books and it's not easy. In fact, it's like, let me put it the other way. It's really effing hard. And so I love what you're asking me here because it just, it shows that no, I actually took a step back. There was a strategy here, everyone. I didn't just suddenly sit down and start writing, which is kind of sort of what I did with the authenticity principle. And I said, I was never going to do that again because not having a really in-depth outline can really F you up as an author. I now know this because I tried that the first time and I was like, no, I'm not doing it the second time. So, so on why did I deliberately embed self-reflection questions for readers to pause on to consider their own experiences in light of my personal stories i shared but also the prescriptive content that ties back to research and frameworks around this is what we know about rewiring the brain this is what we know about trauma this is what we know about healing this is what we know about standing in our power that type of thing mm -hmm. this is what we know about inclusion equity belonging so i did it deliberately because I view this book very much. You call, you mentioned sneaky. Yes. I deliberately designed this book to be a very practical guidebook. I, this isn't a memoir. This is not a memoir. Yes, I talk a lot about my life and and I use my personal stories to model what the research has to say, but I also use my personal stories as a way to model what it looks like to be authentic and sharing our pain. And how do we heal from that? And how do we how do we ultimately experience belonging? But in order for that to happen for others, in order for it to feel really practical, I knew that there were specific things I need to, needed to do. And let's go back to me mentioning I'm a professional speaker. So I literally have presented to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. I've done thousands and thousands of in-person sessions, webinars now. And so teaching people about how to shift behavior, whether it's leadership focused or claiming our belonging, whatever it is, there's a way to create, to, to help people to create behavioral change. And the way in which we do that, yes, is through storytelling, yes, by sharing research data, but it's also about prompting people to engage in self-reflection. And that's what makes learning practical and tangible and real. And so I wanted the book very much to be a practical guidebook. And I knew that self-reflection questions, and uh, there were a few other things I did throughout as well, would help to make that happen. And, but I didn't want it to be so guidebooky, And like, I didn't want it to feel like a self-reflection workbook either. And so I was doing a really carefully curated dance and putting this together. Well, and it and especially because in the the themes that you're that you're working in, you know, that idea of PPA, yes. that that idea of belonging, as as much as they're often framed within uh, a racialized context in right. a lot of the stories that you're telling, yes. you know, really are universal principles. And one of the great things about the questions at the end is that in popping you out of your role as an audience member um you get to you know you're not just putting yourself in the you know kind of in the in the position of of the narrator you get to think about those principles for yourself whoever you are yes and um and that i think is one of the things that makes this do such a good job of not being like you know, as we talked about before, you know, it's it's not a manual for fixing, you know, ills of equity and inclusion. It's you know, it's much more grounded and much more centered than that. Um, it's you know, these are issues that come up much more in racialized contexts, but they really do hit everyone. And it's good to be able to grapple with that, whoever you are. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I when I wrote the book, I wrote it for two audiences. I wrote it for anyone who struggles to belong. Mm -hmm. Anyone. And 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 Michael, here's the thing. Based on my work and research in this space, I have found, I have learned through coaching. I've coached over a thousand professionals now, most of whom are senior leaders within organizations. And there's a lot of homogeneity there, given who makes up leadership ranks. It's largely mm -hmm. cisgender, hetero, white men. I have learned 
that almost every single person struggles to belong in some capacity or another. And so nowhere in my book have I written, this book is intended for women only. This book is intended <laughs> only for people of color. It's like, no, this is a book for anyone who has ever felt like, I can't be who I am because I worry that you're going to judge me. You're going to take love and opportunities away. There are moments I have when I feel really insecure about who I am. Or sometimes I have this feeling inside of me that I'm just not good enough. And because of that, I don't speak at the board meetings or I don't speak at the management committee meeting meetings or I don't tell my family, whatever. And that feeling, by the way, that I'm describing there, that when we have that activation or anxiousness inside of us, we feel like imposters. We've often struggled in the past to name what that feeling is. And I'm going to throw out there that that feeling is a lack of belonging. And then the inverse is also true, by the way, that when we feel like, you know, when we're in a conversation like us right now, Michael, like I feel it right now. I feel it with family members. I feel it when I'm on a stage speaking, when I just feel like I'm in flow and we feel really relaxed and we feel at ease and feel so good. Or even when we're sharing vulnerable things, it's still like, wow, like good for me for doing this. That feeling is belonging. And so in my book or in writing the book, I wanted it to be for anyone who wants to feel more belonging in their life. But I also know that given the leadership work that I do, given the DEI work that I do, that my book was going to make its way into the hands of many leaders who are responsible for creating cultures that are rooted in belonging. And so given this, I knew that my book would be used as a tool for allyship. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is that when we learn more about the lived experiences of inequities, of hurtful and hateful and harmful things that people go through, and we feel their pain, we're more likely to practice empathy. And empathy is a fundamental ingredient for allyship and leadership. And so I knew that when readers would read, leaders would read my book, I was giving them a front row seat to what the barriers to belonging look like and what they could do to exercise more empathy in showing up as allies. You make an argument um, for considering the traumas of our elders our parents, grandparents, those who came before us as, as a driving factor in some of the hurtful behaviors that we experience, not to excuse it, but at least to recognize it. And that's a very difficult line to draw. You Can you speak a bit about how you came to that connection between understanding why someone acts the way they do, but also holding them accountable for it? Yes. You know, I, I'm i sighing and just pausing for a moment just to honor that for so many of us, we've carried heaviness in our bodies for a long time without knowing or understanding where the heaviness comes from. And as I did more and more healing work in my 30s and now in my 40s, and as I've done actually more trauma-based healing work, I've come to understand that a lot of the heaviness I carry within me, yes, it's mine in that it comes directly from my own personal experiences, but a lot of this heaviness and pain that I'm carrying inside of me also comes from the genetic inheritance of trauma and the intergenerational transference of trauma. And as I've, as I have learned more about that, it has been such a transformative experience for me because I'm able to better understand, wow, this heaviness, this is where a lot of this is coming from, but it also has helped me to practice greater empathy for my elders. And so what am I talking about here? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, a window into my, my life, which I talk about at length in the book. So I mentioned earlier, that I was born of Indian immigrant parents. My parents are were born, well, my parents were born into 
the decolonization of India in the 40s. India finally uh, was in a place where it was kicking the British out. The British rule was ending. And my parents were literally born into this moment of decolonization, which we often refer to as partition, many South Asians, because India was carved up in such a way that was also spearheaded by the British that led to millions of displaced people, all kinds of bloodshed, and the emotional, spiritual, structural aftermath that continues to reflect all kinds of destructive pain. And in fact, my mother was a displaced person. She was a newborn when her parents, my grandparents, fled literally with the shirts on their backs. They exiled from now Pakistan to now Delhi, India, so Delhi, in order to escape the bloodshed and be safe from harm. So my mother was a displaced person uh, at a very, very young age at a, as a newborn. And when I think about, we know, we know from uh, growing research that trauma can be passed along through uh, DNA expressions in the sperm, egg, and amniotic fluid. We're, we're learning more and more about this as time passes. My mom was in vitro when her my grandparents were grappling with this, let alone my ancestral lineage that was fighting against the British. And so I'm thinking about what her experience and what lives inside of her. And by the way, she has been very unwell throughout her life, like from a from a middle age to now, my mom is extremely unwell, became disabled at a very young age. I'm like, I often think like how much of that ties back to her experiences, like while she was in vitro and then how much of that is in me and that's just the genetic inheritance like when we take a look at cultures from around the world that experienced oppressive systems like enslavement like colonialism like land theft like genocide and more we can see patterns of mental health challenges physical health challenges abuse, poverty. I mean, I could go on and on about how these systems of pain get passed along. And I'm not justifying toxic behaviors. No, mm -hmm. we each own our individually own our behaviors. We are responsible for our actions. But when we take a step back and, and look at this from a systemic perspective, we can see that these are collective patterned experiences that tie back to what happened to our communities over generations and how these systems of oppression and inequities that continue to persist in our society uphold the pain and the trauma that have been passed along. And so it doesn't excuse toxic behavior but it does help to explain it. And for me in particular, when I think about my elders, I am, and my ancestors, it helps me to have greater empathy and it helps me to have greater desire to interrupt these systems of toxic behavior going forward. You're quite frank about being hurt. Yeah. Um, and even mentioning a period in in adolescence when you were kicked out of the house when the conflict with your parents was so high that um that you weren't there anymore and and so when does you know when do you start to feel some of that empathy inform that relationship because you know it's you know it's unlikely to be happening when you're getting kicked out of the house when for you did some of that realization start to unfold? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm smiling. Um, dear listeners, I'm smiling as you mentioned me being kicked out because <laughs> I can smile about it now. I was like, I think I was 15 or 16 and I was kicked out for like two weeks, something like that. And it, I, I obviously was not smiling at the time, but I can think back to it now and I'm like, wow, like my journey what a wild ride and 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 the reason i'm smiling is because and i'm just kind of also shaking my head like let me tell you in south asian culture 
And this was like the 90s. Okay, so everyone, this is like 30 something years ago. Okay, in South Asian culture, like your parents didn't kick you out back. They're not kicking you out now, let alone kicking you out back then. Like it just Mm -hmm. was unheard of. It was unheard of. And so, but I just, there was a lot of struggle and I was, cha- I was, I was just really, I was just, well, I was deep in deep belief of my right to live authentically, but I didn't know how to do it. And I did have these moments and as, as I would battle with my parents and it was an example of it not being well received, but I didn't, I didn't, under, I, I don't think I was actually able to tap into the empathy piece and see my parents as, and my elders as people who were just on their own journeys to belong, who were also struggling with their own trauma and had their own stories and life hardships until I was much older. Like I would say like, until like I was in my like late twenties and into my thirties, that I started to see more and more like, wow, actually my parents did the best they could under the circumstances. And, and in fact, one of the key messages that I share in my book, and I think this is extremely important for all of us is that we can love and honor our parents, our elders for all of the beautiful ways in which they've influenced us while in tandem being very aware of and drawing attention to the harmful ways in which they parented. Like both can be true. It doesn't have to be either or. And mm-hmm. I think that like for me for a long time, I either or it. Like I was like, oh my God, I'm just like so mad at my parents for being so strict at me. And they just really effed me up. Like I, I would have that in one breath. And then the on um, and then but then I'd feel guilty about it because it would be like but they're they just they were immigrants and they were just doing their best and like Ruthie Basine like how horrible is that like so insensitive like think about all the things Dad did so that things he didn't eat and he didn't buy for himself it's gonna make me cry that he didn't eat or didn't buy for himself so that you could and I, so I would be like oh yes yes no that's right and then I swing to the other side they my parents were the best they were so great I will never say anything wrong about what they did. And actually, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be both. It can be both. And in fact, even with ourselves, let's go back to the the, the point I was making about our PPA armor. It's like we like the, and not being perfect. It's like we are good and we are bad and we are ugly. All of it is true of all of us. We are multidimensional people. And so all of this can be true. But that doesn't mean that just because we have bad and ugly in us we don't get to belong the same way our parents just because they they were just doing their best and replicating the things that they had learned around how to parent even if they were harmful doesn't make them evil necessarily it's like they were on their journeys to belong as well and so we all get to belong and so but this is like this is like this was not in my capacity to reach out to and grasp at the age of 15 or 16 you know like i was i was just like that that wasn't there for me at that point we had the writer uh hua shu on the on the show a couple of months ago to talk about his memoir and one of the things that we discussed was how hard it is to really remember and to remember enough to tell a story and and i think also to remember, you know, in a way that isn't shaped by the feelings that you have now and the ideas that you have now. And was that a a challenge for you as you're pulling some of these things out of your own past to put into this book? That's really interesting. Um, You know, I had the opposite experience. I found Mm -hmm. that uh, there was like, as I one idea or thought came to mind to story tell it it opened up a floodgate of stories and ideas and in fact there's stories that didn't make it to the book because we had to cut and trim or that i just was like i'll just have to save this for another book there's a lot of stories that i i have waiting in the sidelines for for future 
books should I decide to make that happen? And <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not allowed to say I'm going to write another book right now because I think my family and my beloved, my beloveds will like have me by the head. They'll be like, oh, are you kidding me? Because writing a book, let me tell you, it's not just an individual experience. It takes a village and it is really difficult. Or, or let me just say this. There are authors for whom writing must be extremely joyful and beautiful and like the, the clouds part and sunshine emerges and rainbows and cookies and ice creams. That is not me. Like I find it to be extremely painful, extremely arduous, like really difficult. I can't believe I, after the first one I vowed I'd never do it again. And then I did it again. And I'm like, oh, now my friend, my third one, I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Like, did you forget? No, I didn't forget because I remember how hard it is. And I'm like, I'm going to do it again anyways. So I'm like, I'm going to take a minute. But um well, I, w I was just going to say, it, you know, lots of people say it takes a village. We sometimes forget that the village can rise up with torches and pitchforks and come after us. So yeah, we have to be careful. Like, I don't even know what my spouse would say if I said to him, oh, babe, I'm going to get started on book three. Like, I think he might actually break out in a rash right in front of me. So, so yes, but there are, um, for me, actually, and this is why this writing this book was such a beautiful experience in many respects. It was almost like the like opening of the door or like the unraveling of the string that was tying my stories together. And the, I, op I undid the bow and they all just started to shower upon me. And, and yeah, so that's how I felt about the, the memories coming back. And, and the other thing I should say as well is that it was heartbreaking for me to have to relive some of the stories because it's the very first time I've talked about it or even well wrote about it for sure but talked about it there there it was challenging in moments really challenging like it hurt me a lot to to remember that wow I went through this and I think it's so important that I did that because I needed the story to continue in the book's last section, belonging, you make a a connection that it, that I hope talking about doesn't doesn't seem like some kind of spoiler. You connect authenticity, which is subject that you've written about in your previous book, to belonging, and at that point, the whole kind of mechanism of the book clicked into place, and it was clear why so much of the book was about putting on inauthentic selves and learning how to shed those layers. I you know, I think when we yeah, you know, when we hear the word belonging, we you, we all have kind of our own definition of what belonging means. But the but you frame it in a very particular way. And I'm wondering if you can spend just a little bit of time talking about what that notion of belonging means for you and the more expansive sense of the word that you have. Absolutely, because it really speaks to the core of what the book is about. And so I define belonging as being that profound feeling that we hold within ourselves of being, of being honored and accepted for who we are. So belonging is about being able to be ourselves as much as possible and in order for us to claim belonging, we must first and foremost have this experience with ourselves, which is what will cause us, inspire us to claim belonging with others. In other words, we have to embrace and be who we are for ourselves with ourselves, which will give us the spirit to claim belonging with others. Now, as you can already see in how I've defined belonging, it it's really rooted in authenticity. It's about being who you are as much as possible. And so I define authenticity as our, as the consistent practice of choosing to know who we are, to embrace who we are and be who we, who we are. And in fact, this goes directly back to my first book, The Authenticity Principle. Belonging and authenticity go hand in hand they're inextricably intertwined. The more we be who we are, we show up authentically, the more we open the door to experiencing belonging. 
And in order to belong, we must be who we are. And so they, so they go hand in hand. So authenticity enables us to experience belonging. When we're experiencing belonging, it's on the back of being authentic. We can't have one without the other. And this is why I'm an advocate for both. And in fact, it just was a very natural, logical step in place for me to flow in starting by writing a book on authenticity to next go to writing a book on belonging. Because in We've Got This, not only do I explain the connection between authenticity and belonging, what I also do in We've Got This, which is different than the authenticity principle. The authenticity principle is about how do you how do you actually live authentically using the three selves framework, the framework I've developed around for live, being who we are. We've got this is about, yes, be your authentic self and don't let your childhood and adulthood woundedness hold you back. And by the way, this is how you claim it with others. It's the claiming it with others. That's the deep add on from my first book. And so, so I, I deliberately have connected the two concepts and it is a very expansive definition or a framing of the concept of belonging. I think a lot of self-help and leadership books and, and the kinds of books that mm-hmm. want to offer instruction often have like their one key insight that's not too far out of reach from the reader. And you know, they land on it in the first couple of chapters. And then the rest of the book is just like, you know, reiteration and and kind of reframing on that. And you know, in in the book selling world, we call that, you know, that book made a great magazine article. Um, but we've got this builds up to that connection of authenticity and belonging that we just talk about. And it's it's a momentum to the idea that builds over time. And so I, you know, I think listeners can understand us talking about it, like we're talking about the key concepts from it, but there really is a purpose to reading the book in a like in a that linear way to see how you get there. And is you know, when you looked at this relative to, you know, other books of self-help and self-care and and leadership that you've read, were you trying to specifically do something different there? Yes. And so to me, that thread around the connection between authenticity and belonging really like is a core essential thrust of the book. I'm also thinking about how, like if someone were to say to me, what's a key message that you think you would want someone to take away in in reading we've got this and like hold really dear to to your heart going forward. It's this idea of we have to be able to belong to ourselves in order to claim belonging with others. Like that message, and, and it also speaks directly to authenticity because when I say you have to be able to belong to yourself, what am I saying? I'm saying be you with you. Like be yourself with yourself, love yourself for yourself, do that for you with you. Because when we do this, when we deeply embrace who we are at our core, we experience belonging with ourselves. And this is what will cause us to say, excuse me, please don't speak to me that way. Or excuse me, my name is pronounced Ritu. Or actually I was speaking, I'm going to continue to share my thought or I'm not even explain why I wear my hair like this or why I'm wearing a skirt or this is my native cultural indigenous dress or whatever. We don't, we don't feel like we need to have any explanations. It's like we, we expect and demand both directly and indirectly through our energy and what we say and how we behave that others honor us too. And when they don't, we also make a decision around, am I going to, name that you have not honored me? Or am I going to double down within myself? Or am I going to share this with you later? Or will I draw a boundary and I will never talk to you ever again? All of this comes together. 
by anchoring to those two pillars around the connection between authenticity and belonging, but also belonging to yourself is what will help to unlock the power for you to claim belonging with others. At the end of We've Got This, you do something that I personally think authors should do a lot more of, and that is you recommend specific other books to read that will reinforce the the insights that you've been giving people in this book. And now that could just be because I'm a bookseller. Um, and so I like it when people talk about other books and recommend further reading, but I think it's more that I'm a reader and I like to know where else I can go for more. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in what your reading landscape was looking like as you were putting this book together and were there were there other books you reached to or other authors that you looked to as you were trying to figure out the best way to assemble this experience for people? Yeah, so I did a massive environmental scan before I put pen to paper and I I'm already myself a voracious reader and I I both am inspired by what people have to say I and I learn from what others have to say. So I did a lot of reading before and during the writing. And as I was reading and I was writing, I was thinking, you know what, if someone wants more, where should they go? Mm -hmm. And let me provide that, those additional resources, because I love that. I'm like, you author, what do you like? Like, what inspired you? What else should I read? So I wanted that. But also, also, I'm about throwing my love and support behind other authors and so that they get some love. And also I did, I did my darndest to anchor to uh, offering authors, other authors of color, women authors, because I feel like in the publishing world, the publishing world is no different than any other system out there. There is a massive reinforcement of a cisgender, hetero, white, male, elitist normative. And I am a DEI expert and advocate. I happen to be an author as well. And like, I'm not going to try to disrupt the homogeneity and the inequities in the in the publishing world. I'm gonna to try to do that there too. So I'm like, who am I gonna be supporting and, and keep reading? Obviously, I'm gonna to try to support people who I know experience systemic inequities and in having their, their works embraced. And so I was, again, very deliberate about helping others to experience belonging and adding those resources at the end of the book. And in fact, every single thing I did, including choosing a brown cover as a brown girl and recognizing in Canada, it is a struggle to even get a brown hard cover, which is why the Canadian version is black. It's the, the I every single stitch of this book is meant to disrupt and to help cultivate and create belonging, every stitch of it. And I just want to I want to pick up on one thread that you were talking about earlier in yeah you know, in those moments where you consider yourself an author, you have a lot of tools in your communication toolkit. You know, you're a lecturer, you're someone who's comfortable on stage in working one on one or in groups within corporate settings in the media as a consultant. When is a book the right way to get an idea across? out of all of the other ways that you can convey an idea? When does that become the most appropriate package? When we want to go deeper, when we want to go deeper and, and because nothing is more in depth than writing a full book. Like I, I and I say this as someone who does day long facilitations at times, it's, it's still not as deep as writing a book. There's pages and pages and pages of information. And so when we really, truly want to deepen the knowledge and information that we want to share, book writing is an invaluable resource and tool to make that happen. Ruthie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Michael, for creating this space for me to share. And to everyone who is tuning in today, thank you. I have been speaking with Ruthu Basin, author of We've Got This, Unlocking the Beauty of Belonging. Find it at Kobo and Conversation's home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. And share this episode with a friend or a colleague or even your boss. 
Anybody who loves a good book chat belongs here. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.